doing really well. Certainly. And you know, what's, what's kind of interesting is the combination of what's going on nationally and here in Louisiana is honestly something that could probably fill up multiple hours of conversation, but I will keep it at a fairly high level so that we can fit it in in an hour. The interesting thing, I'll start with the federal because, of course, there's scarcely been a dull moment since January 20th. What I think is kind of an appropriate opening soundbite with regards to discussions about the Trump administration, it's a subject that's very tough for anybody to be objective about, but I'm certainly going to give it my best try. But there's one number that to me defines the entire Trump administration. That is the number 46. 46 represents the percentage of the vote that he received in the national, the, the percentage of the national popular vote that he received which even though the popular vote is not what directly elects the president, it is a gauge for a, of a president's strength. And one of the things about that 46 number, which I find very interesting, besides the fact that it is less than a majority and the fact that Hillary Clinton received 3 million votes more than he did, that 46 is very similar to his approval ratings. Now, you hear, depending on whose point of view you listen to, you're going to hear different things about his approval ratings and they're cratering or they're good or this or that. Let me put it in proper perspective. His approval ratings have since January 20th been extremely similar to that 46% of the national popular vote that he received. And the most recent data I have, I've been going to Real Clear Politics every day and grabbing mm -hmm. numbers like the approval rating, Obamacare approval, approval of Congress, et cetera, et cetera. More specifically, his approval ratings using an aggregate of polls that everybody's taking about that, his approval rating since mid-March is 44% approved and 52% disapproved. Since his presidency has begun, his approval rating has been in a very tight and narrow range, anywhere from 45 to 44 to 46%. In other words, the numerator, which is his approval, has not changed very much, and it's very, very similar to the popular vote he received last year. The thing about that number, which I think ought to cause him some concern, number one, any new president is going to start off with a honeymoon, and number two, if he is unable to expand his base beyond that 45%, that signifies a lot of electoral trouble for him next year. And in the immediate future, there is a series of five congressional special elections that are going to be going on between April and June. The one that has my attention is the one in Georgia. The one, it's in the Atlanta suburbs. Historically, a Republican district that actually uh, elected Newt Gingrich for years. Well, this is a district that, because it is high income, and white collar swung decisively towards Hillary Clinton, or depending on your point of view, away from Donald Trump last year, a Democratic victory in that district, I think would be a very negative sign about what's going on with the Trump administration. But getting back to the main point of what I want to say, that 46% to me is kind of a benchmark for his future plans, and it is kind of a visual for his challenges for the next four years. He's got to be able to bring people over to his side if he wants to be reelected. And to his side, people who did not vote for him last year. Okay. Yes.
Yeah. And you know what's kind of interesting too? So when we're talking about the 46%. I think another large part of the Trump administration right now is what the outcome is going to be on efforts to repeal and replace Obamacare. Because there's a very interesting compare and contrast that's going on. So you have this compare and contrast with a very rough struggle from what I'm seeing to get the Republican version of health care reform passed, while at the same time, the Neil Gorsuch confirmation Despite the fact that I think you have the partisan lines have been drawn in the sand, Neil Gorsuch's confirmation has gone relatively smoothly, considering mm -hmm. that you have almost unanimous Democratic opposition to just about anything that the Trump administration is going to propose, as evidenced by the narrow votes on quite a few of his uh, cabinet nominees. Yeah, I bet. So his favorables have actually been fairly consistent. And what I'll do is read off the numbers in two week blocks. And, for, and to be fair to him, I only started looking at the numbers after he got inaugurated. So in the latter half of January, it was a 45-43 favorability. The first half of February, 46 favorable, 49 unfavorable. Second half of February, 44 favorable, 50 unfavorable. The first half of March, 45 favorable, 50 unfavorable. And since March 15, 44 favorable, 52 unfavorable. So his favorability rating, it's not good, but it has been very constant. So the way I look at it is he has a solid 45, 46% behind him. He's got to be able to grow that, though. He cannot go into the 2020 or even the 2018 midterm elections with a 45% approval rating. That's that that's not something that will garner him any respect for having political strength. Right, right, right. So you have several pollsters that are conducting polls on the uh, approval rating. You have Gallup is showing him in the 30s. Rasmussen is showing him in the upper 40s. There's also other pollsters like PPP, which is Democratic leaning, will chime in from time to time. Reuters will chime in from time to time. I take all of those numbers and aggregate them. And the thing is, it's been a very consistent mid 40s has been his approval rating. So in other words, this, and this goes back to a conversation that you and I had last year where I don't get excited about individual poll releases. I'm more interested in what the aggregate of all polls tell us over a period of time. And that aggregate has pretty consistently been showing mid 40s. So I think that the truth is somewhere in between what Gallup and what Rasmussen are saying. Okay. Yes. Well, let me address that in a short term and a long term way. In the short term, he has a solid base of support that is solidly behind him. And that solid base of support has not changed very much since the election. And I've, I've had a couple of opportunities to throw in a Trump approval rating for any polls I've done in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are pretty, depending on the part of the state they are in, the numbers are pretty similar to what I saw his uh, election numbers were last November. So nothing particularly surprising here. Now, when we talk about the long term, however, 
what has to happen is he has to have some legislative accomplishments. And this is, and we're talking about holding on to the base. We're not even talking about bringing independents and wavering Republicans over to his side. That's a totally separate discussion. For purposes of maintaining his base, there's going to be an expectation that his campaign promises relative to building the wall, relative to health care reform and, and the like, he's going to have to show accomplishments on those uh, battlegrounds to hold on to the base because there, there's some expectations with regards to why they supported him. They meaning the 46% of Americans who voted for him in the election. So, Yeah, and you know, the thing about that, I think, does not spell positive outcomes for this legislation because you kind of get the feeling, and I'm saying this kind of from stepping back my 500 feet, so to speak, just from what I've been reading and seeing and hearing, I don't really detect kind of a, a, a desire to pass a bill. It seems like every faction has their own little set of non negotiable demands. And to me, there's no such thing as the perfect bill that ever gets passed. There's always going to be compromises and trade-offs that have to be made. That goes back to the old adage about not wanting to see laws and or sausage being made. There's another aspect, too, to I think the challenge you have with the Republicans' efforts with health care reform, and that is this. With the case of what Obama had done, that bill did not get signed until March of 2010. In other words, one year and two months into his administration after there were there was a stimulus bill passed and there were efforts made with cap and trade and card check this is the first bill coming out of the chute that they're trying to pass and in my opinion the fact that there was not a unified package that came to the floor or to committee i think is a problem for this bill because all this wrangling that's going on now to me should have been fleshed out since 2010 when health care reform was passed because politics has a natural ebb and flow to it. Anybody would know that at some unspecified point in the future, the Republicans would have control of government and they could do something with health care reform. I don't get the feeling that that discussion ever was there in terms of what do we want to do with this car once we caught it. So now you have a bill where you have a very ugly public kind of thrashing out of differences amongst the various party factions. And by the way, we're talking about all this infighting going on amongst Republicans. There has not, in my view, been an effort to bring in any Democrats. So you're talking about trying to herd cats when you don't have 60 plus percent majorities like the Democrats did in 2009. So in other words, what I see happening is a lot of unnecessary posturing and wrangling over a bill when the desire should be to pass something that's 90% perfect and then try to work out differences as it goes through the process because we're talking about trying to get a bill out of the House. We haven't even begun to talk about what it would take to get it through the Senate, right, through reconciliation. Right, right. right. Um, you know, it's funny because I did notice that one of the reasons why I was getting this feedback, at least, you know, is that I didn't plug in my microphone. Uh, we mm. have some video problems. So now the microphone is plugged in. Uh, hopefully the technology is now working. I do apologize. We had some video problems that caused a delay. Uh, let me just give an overview for those people who might be uh, just picking up right now. Uh, John Cuvion of James, James C. Uh, polling and, and Analytics. Um, 
is uh, has basically telling us that what he has found in terms of the polling numbers that he has begun to pick up since the, uh, I guess, uh, January. The inauguration. Uh -huh, uh, is that the there's really been pretty much of a baseline of all the polls collected together, um, a drop of maybe 2% over say the uh, 60 uh, plus days and that is it that all the stuff that was heard in coming out in terms of uh, the tweets both favorable and non-favorables there have been you know really no change uh, his 46 percent has been pretty static go ahead yeah and there's a salient point from what and this is kind of piggybacking on to what you said about the minimal drop, you'll remember back during the fall when there were some pretty controversial things that were going on with regards to Alicia Machado with his tax returns, right, right. with the Access Hollywood remarks he had made, et cetera, et cetera. And I had noted that the poll numbers did not really change that much relative to what I would have expected to happen to an ordinary an ordinary candidate. So that suggested to me that he had a very solid base of support. So in a sense, you kind of have that continuing to this point where I would be surprised to see an aggregate of polls showing him all of a sudden plunging to 40% or below. But anyway, as you were saying, I, I just thought this was kind of a salient point to add some historical context to what you're saying about a minimal change in his po uh, approval rating. Now, as far as... I don't want to give his feedback, but as far as the health care issue, it, it, it would, um, I mean, he needs a win. There's no question yes. about that. He needs a win. Yes. For the short term. But the question is, in my mind, is whether or not it may help him in the long term. You know, because right. uh, he, he needs a win, but the bill as is is a very much of a compromise piece of legislation it is the thing i think that he's got to be very careful about expectations or fears are a very tricky thing in the world of politics you will remember that concerns about obamacare cost the democrats heavily in 2010 yeah. and the disastrous rollout of healthcare.gov in the fall of 2013 reverberated a year later and cost a lot of Senate Democratic incumbents their jobs, such as Mary Landrieu, but also the Republicans won in the governorships and in House races as well in 2014. So in other words, sure. that one action, which was all kinds of problems with the rollout of a website and people losing their insurance policies which overlaid against President Obama's promise about nobody losing their insurance, that created the perfect political storm, so to speak. What Donald Trump's administration needs to be very, very careful about is fears of people getting kicked off of their insurance plans in the present, whether it be they were enrolled through Medicaid, expanded Medicaid or through an exchange, the fear of losing insurance is something I don't think the Republicans need to be uh, blowing off. I think the town halls, to some extent, are a bit should be a bit of concern for them with regards to voter sentiment and or fears. You'll notice when looking at the polls, over the years, Obamacare has had a base of support, but that base has all of a sudden jumped into the upper 40s, low 50s, and I think we're getting into fear of the unknown. In other words, people without having a concrete plan in place are afraid of losing their insurance. That's something Republicans need to be very, very careful about making sure that doesn't happen because people have long memories, especially when you talk about something about losing insurance or losing yeah. their yeah. insurance. Indeed. Uh, you know, yeah. you know you, I think you're making a really good point. Uh, so what he needs to consider, as well as uh, everybody at this point, is is uh, what's going to happen in roughly two years. Yes. Now he, he well, arguably, yeah, two years, and arguably this year too, because in addition to those five congressional special elections that'll be going on between April and June, 
You also have gubernatorial races in Virginia and New Jersey where even though those are states that both voted for Hillary Clinton, if you had Democratic victories in both of those states, and worse yet, let's pretend those victories were blowouts, that would be something the media would be kind of setting the narrative for troubles in Republican paradise. And that's something that, you know, like I said, the Republicans need to be very sensitive about that with regards to what gets passed with health care reform. My personal opinion, if let's pretend I were in the same room as Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. I would pull the plug on this thing right now because when you have people basically holding their breath until they turn blue because the bill is not 100% the way they like it, to me, there needs to be a little bit more, I guess, back and forth that needs to occur between the different factions of the Republican Party before they present their face to the outside world of, the, uh, of this is our health care bill. My concern is if they rush something through to make themselves look good, there's going to be inevitable in implementa implementation problems which are going to come to bite them in the rear end in next year's and this year's elections. But the I'm of the opinion they should slow down, in other words. I see, but the, but the problem is that this... I don't know what's going on with the audio. The, the, the problem is, as I see it, though, is that he needs to go ahead and, uh, and really jumpstart his other his other pieces of legislation, you know the tax cuts and all. I mean, uh, you know, look what happened with the stock market yesterday. Not that you know that means much, but I mean he's gotten he's gotten so much um, positives because he's come in as being or seemingly invincible. Right. You know that that he can fix the economy that. You know he can make it work, and so if he can't make this work, if he can't get that one win, especially a guy who is whose um, ego is so framed around winning. Yeah. Well, what I what I will say about that is that from a competence standpoint, I certainly agree he has to have legislative accomplishments here. Because the first year of a president's term is really when you get the maximum of your pa of your package through. It's almost like whatever you do the first year is kind of the pinnacle, and after that, it's very tough to get much accomplished. The last president I could think of who consistently had things passed throughout his career was President Reagan, where he had his initial tax cuts in 81, but he also had a tax reform which passed in 1986. He also had significant uh, accomplishments he could talk he could talk about with regards to nuclear disarmament and uh, relationship with the former USSR that occurred all the way into his last year. So, I mean, you can do things after the first year, but from a practical standpoint, your presidency does get defined by that first year. I mean, look at President Obama. What happened was that he had large Democratic majorities, and they tried to put pass a lot of things at once. They were able to get the stimulus through. They were able to get Obamacare through after a year and two months. Card check kind of died. Cap and trade kind of died. But point being was all of those things he was trying to do legislatively the first year. And beyond that, I think he turned to regulatory agencies and or the judiciary to get what he wanted done in the succeeding seven years. Because once the Republicans took Congress, he didn't have those large majorities to protect him anymore, and all of a sudden, a lot of his package was unpalatable to congressional Republicans. Sure, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, so let's let's talk about you know the I guess the big news story of the week uh, for many, and that is you know, obviously his administration, his campaign transition team. Etc. are now under a dark black cloud, an FBI investigation. I mean, look, there's no way to get around it. You know, uh, during a campaign, he said, uh, and his campaign said, that how can somebody be president if they're under a criminal investigation? Yeah. Well, 
let me be careful here since I'm not an attorney. <laughs> so, oh, and, and I'm not saying yeah. I'm not saying that he yeah. personally is right. under well, investigation. Me, I'm using that very globally. Right. Uh, his his um, his identity, okay, is yeah. under investigation. It's his it's a negative cloud. I will agree with you there. Yeah. W w without really having intimate knowledge of all the specifics. My impression of this is this is something that has been lingering around and some way or another he has to get it resolved because it seems like taxes and Russians have been his consistent problems for months and months. I think in the short term he has kind of laid the taxes issue to rest even though what he did was not 100% disclosure. What he did was display or what was displayed were two pages of his tax returns when for one year when the meat is really all those supporting schedules that go behind the two pages. But to the average person, they're going to see that he released two pages of a tax return and the desire to see more and more, I think, probably has dissipated now that something is out there. <sighs> well, um, so that raises the question, who actually released uh, those uh, tax returns? I mean, you, you said that he released them. There were, well, the way I understand it was that you had Rachel Maddow wanting to get her media scoop, and then she was uh, scooped by several hours by someone else releasing the tax returns independently, and presumably it was somebody connected with Trump. And, and I'm saying presumably because, of course, I don't know the exact specifics, but from an, a political optics standpoint, by getting that information out there before Rachel Maddow had a chance to talk about it, I think it did pop the balloon, so to speak, on that one particular issue. Ray, 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 a, a real serious question, if, if I might, and, and that is, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, did, did Maddow actually announce that she, what year she had the returns? The two-page return. Did did she announce yeah. that? And Good question. Was that, was that was that out there in public? Because otherwise, how would he know, or how would whoever release it to the other source to get it out there? How would they know yeah. that we're talking about two thousand and five? Good question. And I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of different ways to look at that, and I, I'm not qualified to go down that line of lane of speculation. Yeah, because what happens there, if you don't mind, is that that really begins to, if assuming that it's the same year and that somebody released it before uh, Rachel Maddow, you know, then it looks to me like it, it was a, a real clear plant, you know, by, and I'm, I'm just on it out yeah. based upon the facts that I'm being presented. Plus, you know, he, here's the thing. 2005 was a year, was a year prior to his wife having to release her, her information, you know, because keep in mind, you know, she was uh, tr trying to uh, become an American citizen. So she had to release some tax records and hmm. the 2005 year was released. Uh, and, and so there's other issues uh, there in terms of why that that year was released. I've never bought into the whole argument that 2005 represents a release of, represents a, a um, how can I say, a, that that is a reflection for her, for their other tax years. Mm -hmm. In, you know, just like a, you know, 1980, in 79 taxes that show that he didn't pay any taxes would not reflect to me, you know, that he had 20 or 30 years of, of not paying taxes. 2005 is not a reflection at all to show that he did in fact pay taxes. There's yeah. a game going on here. Uh, you know, there, yeah. there's, there is a game going on here. And uh, I think that when you look at what's going on now with Russia and the FBI. Let me throw some out to you. 
you know, FBI said that he did not, you know, uh, the uh, the director of FBI said he didn't he did not need those records. Yeah. You know, so what does that mean? Nobody asked, nobody followed up with that question. What records does he have? Yeah. Well, this Russian issue, I think, is something that it's at some point it's going to have to be addressed because it's certainly not something that he wants lingering around for the remainder of his first term and or until the midterms because it is you never want to have a cloud a cloud when you're a president and this is certainly a cloud the the only thing though i think that does need to be debated and again i'm i'm gingerly treating i'm sure. gingerly touching on the touching on this topic because i'm not an attorney and you're getting into all kinds of intricacies of criminal law which i'm ill equipped to talk about but the thing that is kind of curious to me is when you're talking about the word influence the election influence to me is a very nebulous term if you're talking about let's say you had russian hackers who were going into individual county boards of elections and trying to alter the totals that to me is a substantially different thing than meetings because it seems like neither party was innocent on the meetings with russians number one and number two there was also the question of what former President Obama knew and when he knew it, because you're talking about something that, from what I understand, they had knowledge of for several months, but it wasn't released for a while. And so you kind of have to ask the question of why that was being sat on for a while. So in other words, I think the story has a lot of tentacles and a lot of it's very legal in nature. And so... I can really give you kind of a general perspective. I do think it's something that I don't see it going away. Certainly not after, you know, what Comey did when he went to Congress. He's kind of raised the specter of that issue again, just like what he did when he talked about Hillary Clinton's emails right before the election. The question is how much there there is there. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah for sure. So from a, a political standpoint, which is really, I think, what you're equipped to talk about in terms yes. of uh, polling, etc., cetera, um, would you anticipate a, a, uh, a shop dropping? I mean, look what, ha look what happened with Hillary Clinton. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, and, and it is my opinion. I actually wrote something today and I'm, I'm trying to uh, find what it is that, that I, I wrote. Um, and because it, it it deals directly with what you're what you were just saying okay so i i did find it so let, let me just go ahead and, and kind of read it and i'm going to put this up okay. uh, I, I i have very little doubt whether by collaboration by team trump members or by coincidence trump received great benefit with russian involvement likewise the Comey decision to inform Congress with that letter at the moment, whether he was right to do so or not, also impacted the election significantly. Clinton looked like she was going to pull ahead with a double-digit win. The Comey letter not just didn't just stop the upward momentum, it accelerated the reversal. In short, it was a one-two punch which changed the course of the election. The problem is, it is impossible to determine what statistical impact either or both, meaning either the Comey letter or the drip drip had yeah. on the ultimate victories in those state key states and in Florida. From a scientific and legal perspective, one cannot trace each vote and can extrapolate from the numbers, but that would be it. It's circumstantial. But I vividly recall all the TV spots, the news reports, the social media posts, etc., resulting from the drip 
drip and from the wallop by Comey letter. If Nita would have occurred, we might be looking at a Madam President rather than the Manchurian man. Well, one thing I could tell you, so there was the statement about the Hillary Clinton lead. I went back and looked at polls because I, I actually did this analysis for a separate speech I did last week. I actually took it, I actually analyzed the national polls in the aggregate before and after the date of that Comey letter being released. And what I saw was a two point impact. In other words, just as I was mentioning to you earlier that the various controversies that Donald Trump got into with regards to Alicia Machado, his tax returns, the Access Hollywood tape, et cetera, et cetera, did not move the numbers substantially against him. Just the same, what happened with Comey, it had an impact, but I calculated it was only about two points. In other words, the race tightened two points after the release that after he was mentioning that he was going to ha perhaps have to reinvestigate Hillary Clinton. Now, could those two points, if evenly distributed, have impacted the results in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin? To me, anything is possible because you're talking about 78,000 votes in those three states that put Donald Trump into the White House. But at the same time, if you're talking about what was going on in the run-up to the election, one of the things that I saw happen was that you had several things going on demographically last year, some in concert with each other and some in contradiction with each other. So everybody knows that the affluent white collar vote moved away from Donald Trump. And it happened here in Louisiana, incidentally, as well as nationally. So in other words, if you were to look at areas of the East Bank of Jefferson Parish, the southern part of East Baton Rouge Parish, and then I saw parts of Caddo and Lafayette, there was a drop in the support that Trump got relative to what Mitt Romney got four years ago in those same areas. I also saw a drop in Donald Trump's support in suburbs of Atlanta and Dallas, et cetera, et cetera. He more than overcompensated for those losses by, of course, he did very well with the blue collar vote. He did very well with the rural vote and he got the turnout up in those areas. So they kind of counterbalanced each other. But there's two other things that were going on at the same time, which got varying amounts of coverage from the media. One was the Hispanic vote did surge. Actually, uh, one specific example I was able to use, the state of Georgia tracks a person's race when they look at the post-election statistics. I was able to see that compared, compared 2016, 2012, black turnout in Georgia dropped numerically whereas Hispanic turnout increased 66%. Now, that was not in itself going to turn Georgia to Hillary Clinton, but I do think that that combined with Donald Trump's weak support in the affluent suburbs of Atlanta made Georgia a closer state than it should have been. So Georgia is an example that I think could arguably be replicated elsewhere in Texas and Arizona and California and Nevada. Hispanics were energized to vote. So uh, let, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Of all of the reasons that Donald Trump won and Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton lost, yes, what, say, were the top three reasons? That, you know, he, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm talking about yeah. the popular vote. And I'm going to throw in some demographics here. This was kind of what I was saying in a much longer fashion a few seconds ago. So what helped Donald Trump was that there was a surge in support in rural and or blue collar areas that perhaps were not as enthusiastic about Mitt Romney, number one. Number two, he was hurt by losing support with white collar and affluent voters. Number three, the Hispanic vote went against him heavily. But number four, this was the part I was just about to get to, black support dropped. In other words, in terms of turnout percent and, and the number who voted, black turnout dropped relative to 2012. You can make an argument that that also contributed to what happened in Pennsylvania. Because when you have Hillary Clinton needing that gigantic vote out of Philadelphia and the remaining parts of the state were going heavily for Trump, that is one of many factors, just like a, a reduced black turnout in Milwaukee and Detroit. 
So that was something else that helped Trump. I think, too, what hurt Hillary Clinton, the basket of deplorables remark. Okay. okay. Because you had people who were fairly uh, solid in their support of either candidate. The only times I saw blips were the Comey letter, Alicia Machado, it had a minor impact, Donald Trump's debate performances, minor impact. But the basket of deplorables hurt Hillary Clinton as well because September is when people start making up their minds about which candidate they're going to support. And you'll remember September 2012 was when Mitt Romney made his infamous, uh, the, or excuse me, the infamous 47% remark was revealed. He actually made the remark several months before. But point being is you never want to get caught making that kind of remark when voters are paying attention. I think the basket of deplorables hurt Hillary Clinton as well. It was kind of, to me, like, something that that kind of helped pave the way for Donald Trump's victory, like possibly the Comey letter or the lower black turnout or the fact that Hillary had weak margins amongst union and rural voters. All of those things all played a part, in my opinion. If I recall if I correctly, correctly, basically, basically in, in terms of the popular vote, he was at about 5 or 6% up at the point in time that the Comey letter came out. I never saw him ahead. I no, think... No, no, well, I'm, I'm sorry. She was about five or six points. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I, it was I, four, I, but yes. Yes. I saw it I saw it tighten from four to two. But okay. yes, I will otherwise, other than being nitpicky like that, I will otherwise agree with your assertion. Okay, so um, in terms of the issue uh, being raised, uh, what issues were... I, I guess, I guess the the real question I'm trying to get at is is the impact of uh, Hillary Clinton's lack of credibility and the impact of of the you know the the I don't like Hillary because I don't trust her you know she may be a criminal that that whole that whole I guess ball of negativity that is that she is that she was facing. How much of a role did that play? It certainly didn't help because the thing is, when you have a series of events that hurt your credibility or make people think a certain way about you, there's not a lot that you can do to change that in a short period of time. So when you're talking about the the, the perception of corruption. To me, the email issue had a surprising amount of staying power, and I think the reason it had staying power was it confirmed people's existing suspicions about her that not all was right with Clintons. Just like the 47% remark with Mitt Romney, in my opinion, was a culmination of other gaffes that he had done that had created the impression that he was an out-of-touch plutocrat. So with... <laughs> With this everyday dripping of information about Manafort and uh, and so many other things that are coming up, whether or not the information is accurate mm -hmm. or not, I guess my question is, you know, do you expect more than just a two percent drop? What I think is happening is. I don't think that what's going on is going to cause his approval rating in the aggregate to go down to the 30s, but what I think is equally as concerning for him is that if that 45 to 46 percent number becomes a ceiling, that is something he has to be concerned about. I don't think the existing 45 to 46 percent that are for him are going to melt away unless there's some major Watergate style uh, revelation. But I think it's never good if you prevent yourself from having room to grow because that's what hurt Hillary Clinton. I'll tell you another thing too, Steve, that I think ought to be thrown out on the table when you're talking about why the election results went the way they did. One of the things I saw happen as well was that back in September, the aggregate vote that Gary Johnson and Jill Stein was getting was about 10%. And it started steadily melting away to where by election day it was in the 3 to 4% margin. One of the things I had a, poll, a national pollster tell me, which I think has some credence, is that if you were supporting a third-party candidate back in the 
August and September, that meant that you weren't sold on either one of the two major candidates. And Hillary Clinton was really a quasi-incumbent. So I think an argument can be made as well when you're talking about things that could influence the election. If you came to the realization that a vote for Gary Johnson was a wasted vote and you had to have somewhere where you could go, if you were supporting him in the third place, in the first place, chances are you wanted an outsider who would shake up the system and so forth. And given that mindset, Donald Trump was the lesser of two evils. <clears throat> in other words, the Gary Johnson vote did not go to Hillary Clinton. I'll bet you some of it probably showed up in Donald Trump's column as well. So, but, but I think though, getting get, with regards to what you're saying about Manafort, <clears throat> he, Donald Trump, has to be able to get this issue behind him because if an impression is created after being president for six months that is not favorable about the Russians, if he's stuck at 45% approval rating throughout his term in the presidency, that makes life a lot tougher for him going forward because no one in Congress is going to respect somebody who has a 45% approval rating. It'd be an entirely different situation if your approval rating were on the steady rise into the 50s and 60s. Especially, especially if those people, say, in the Freedom Caucus, who decide not to uh, go with Ryan's bill or and Trump's bill, if, if they make the argument that 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 Ryan and Trump were selling out. But you know, it's kind of a no-win situation when we, you're talking about the Freedom Caucus because. Let's go back to 2009. You'll remember the Democrats, or at least the more progressive liberal wing of the Democratic Party, felt very strongly about the public option. And mm -hmm. it took President Obama throwing his weight behind a more quote-unquote compromise plan that was basically his signal that he saw the public option as a non-starter, and the liberal Democrats fell into line. That kind of thing has to happen with the Freedom Caucus. In other words, I can appreciate if there's a package that they want passed, but if they're going to scuttle something over a bill that may be 90% perfect, I don't think they'll have a more favorable chance or, or make more favorable circumstances to pass the bill they want than right now. In other words, mm -hmm. I just don't, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand where the path to passing legislation is if you have a group that's going to kind of sit out on the bill and the Republicans could ill afford to lose too many members. In fact, I saw, I was reading something yesterday, there was a whip count going on, it was a tweet. It was saying that already 27 House Republicans have lined up against the bill. And that's deadly to have that many party defections on your first major piece of legislation as the party in charge. So in other words, I'm, I'm not really sure what I see the end game is on this bill, but it, it's not to me a path to victory. We have all these sides that are finding what they disagree with, and then the president is threatening to, you know, have their heads on a platter next year. You know, none of that to me creates a positive climate for passing some potentially far-reaching legislation. Um, I'm looking right now at... Let's see, uh, this actually it's on MSNBC, but uh, breaking news, GOP on verge of killing Trump health plan. Yeah. Um, you know, these are, are uh, posts that are just, have just come out. Uh, 16 minutes ago, Roger Stone, Democrats engaged in fear mongering on Russia claims. Uh, just looking it's really amazing because you know this is these are thoughts that people have at at the moment yeah. um rex tillerson i didn't want this job i didn't seek this job my wife told me i'm supposed to do this uh, yeah that's these are again uh articles that are, that yeah go ahead there, there's something else that you just brought up in those articles that I think is another salient point about the Trump administration. So the first salient point is I'm basically going down a very long rabbit hole by, by discussion of that one number, 46%. There's another salient point here for the Trump administration that, in my opinion, he has to get under the control, and that is he has a group of White House staffers under him 
who are basically freelancing. In other words, you have Sean Spicer going in one direction, Kellyanne Conway in another, uh, Bannon in another, Rex Rance Priebus in another. The part about that that I think is deadly for Donald Trump is that while I know he relishes kind of pitting his aides against, or his underlings against each other, you cannot have the appearance of disunity in a presidential administration. Because the public expects to see a president who has his act together and has one unified message and is moving forward. Right now, you have all this freelancing and every man for himself going on, and I think that's deadly. And that goes back to, in my opinion, what's happening with the health care reform right now, where you kind of have everybody having their own little list of non-negotiable demands without, to me, an effort to pass a bill. Just out of curiosity, out of how is, uh, say, Kellyanne and Spicer going in different directions? What I'm referring to there is when you're seeing inconsistent communications going on between the two. Let's pretend for a second that you had a press conference where Spicer said something, and then six hours later, Kellyanne contradicts him. That, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. Well, here's here's some uh, breaking news, okay? And maybe you already know about it. I don't know, but uh, this just looked like it just came out. The House Intelligence Chair Devin Nunes will hold a press conference on the Russia investigation today at one p.m. So that means twelve p.m. Which means twelve, yeah, okay. Central Time. Yeah, that's going to be pretty interesting. That's I, I I know that you know neither you nor I have any idea what that but a press conference by the chairperson. My speculation, and again, it's speculation, is that they're going to say that they're going to call a particular witness. Mm. That's I don't know what else they can do at this yeah. point in terms of a press conference. I mean, that's weird. Making a statement? I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, and I guess I'm just speculating, but maybe they are, I mean, Nunes would not call a press conference, in my opinion, unless they had, they were going to call a major witness or unless they had some new information that was favorable to Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. But you know, here's the other thing going on, though, that I think you kind of have to consider. It's almost like you have so many different competing kind of sources of noise going yeah. on. In other words, you have the health care reform bill, you have this investigation, you have the Gorsuch nomination. In other words, it seems like all these items are kind of canceling other, each other out. <clears throat> with regards to which one gets the most attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but that's not good for the administration, is it? Or is it good because that's that seems to be what Don, Donald Trump likes. He likes, you know, all, he likes to diffuse. What I think he has to have, when you're talking about quick victories, I think if Gorsuch comes through, that would be something good that he could hang his hat on. Because he can't say he kept his, he, Donald Trump, kept his promise to conservatives regarding the types of judicial appointments he would make. And from what I've seen and read, it seems like Gorsuch is not one of those types of judicial nominees that is very controversial and automatically strikes sparks with people like Robert Bork did a generation ago. Right. And, you know, one thing, too, for good or for ill, Robert Bork created a precedent with regards to Supreme Court nomination hearings in that after he was very candid with his opinions and it had disastrous impacts, no judicial nominee, certainly not a Supreme Court nominee, is going to be that forthcoming ever again. Now, there's another thing, too, I think that benefits Gorsuch that is just one of those circumstantial things, and that is – if you're talking about the Democrats thinking of how far they want to push this in opposition, a Gorsuch nomination is exchanging a vacant seat held by a conservative with another conservative. In other words, 
it's not really that much of a game changer like Clarence Thomas's was in 1991 when he was replacing a deceased liberal justice. Sure. Now, sure. if let's pretend that you were to have a Ruth Bader Ginsburg or someone like that depart the court, that would be a brutal court nomination fight just because then you are talking about illogical change. But the stakes are not quite as high, despite the chattering you may hear from one side. The stakes are not quite as high with Gorsuch because it's just merely putting a fifth justice back on the bench, a fifth conservative justice back on the bench when it had five conservatives before. So I'm not convinced the Democrats are going to go all, all thermonuclear on this one. I do think it's probably going to be one of those nominations like Samuel Alito where it won't get filibustered, but I'd be surprised if it cracked 55 votes. It meaning the number of votes that Gorsuch gets in the end. And if that happens, if that happens. He's on the court. If he, if he gets fifty-five votes. Oh well, okay. There's two separate things I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ultimate votes to confirm him, as opposed to the votes to invoke closure to, you know, allow the nominee t nomination to proceed. I don't. I don't think the Democrats would necessarily filibuster this one, but I think they would line up nearly in lockstep, opposing him for the final vote. So, um, let, let me ask you this: I mean, if he doesn't, if he doesn't get the sixty votes, then, or if they don't have the sixty votes, then you have the nuclear option, right? If, in fact, the Democrats filibuster, you're right. My question is if they're even going to filibuster it, because even though I detect right now that you have a lot of partisan anger coming from the Democratic side against the Trump administration. The question in my mind is, for someone like Gorsuch, where the stakes are not that high, if they would want to throw away a chance to have that filibuster in the future. I guess that's really more my point, is right, if they're right, even going to right. go thermonuclear on this one. Because the thing was, you'll remember way back in 2005 when Bill Frist threatened the use of the nuclear option back then because some Bush nominees had been hanging around for two, three years, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden the Democrats quickly said, okay, let's let's compromise. I'm not convinced that Gorsuch would necessarily be one of those where the Democrats would go all out, yeah. filibuster. Now, if it were, say, replacing a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that would be a much more contentious nomination battle. That I can tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I, I tell you what, I really appreciate your – uh, just spending yeah. an hour with us. I'm sorry that we had some technical difficulties in terms of both video and audio. Um, and so, nevertheless, this is it has been playing live on Bayou Buzz. Um, and also, it's been playing live on Facebook and, and Twitter and Periscope. And we will edit this and get, you know, the best, the best quality in terms of audio and video and put it up on YouTube. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Listen, it's been a great discussion, I think. A really, really super yeah. discussion. There's so much to talk about. If anything, Donald Trump, um, you know, he certainly, you know, is has um, brought a lot of interest, you know, into the, the political discussion. That's yeah. for sure. You know, in fact, a little, a little funny, funny story sure. I could tell you. Anytime I want. It, one of the things I've seen is putting the words Donald Trump or a question about Donald Trump in any poll I do, it has a material impact on the poll responses. Those are so really he's the gift that keeps on giving, so to speak. So are you saying that it's easier for you to, to poll if you, if you do yes. that? Interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, so is, is it the first question? Yes. Oh, yeah. You have to make the first question. Yeah. In other words, you throw something in there like Trump approval. And I saw what happened last year in polls where the thing about polling is different types of races generate different levels of enthusiasm, meaning it's easier to poll, say, a presidential race than, say, just use an example, like a justice of the peace race. You know, or, or a race like that where people don't really have opinions about the candidates, much less know who they are. Mm -hmm. But you put the words Donald Trump as the first question on a poll, and it does uh, it does have a uh, – in other words, 
he's kind of like he gets people's attention. I will say that. That that he does. So why don't you uh, uh, stick around for a second? I'm going to end this on uh, Twitter and Periscope by pushing okay. this button. And we've done that. And now I'm going to uh, end this every place else. I really do appreciate you taking your time being with us. Oh, no problem.